Let's go out there. It's November 29th. My friend Curry's just the Wall Street Unplugged Podcast where I break down the headlines and... Uh, tell you what's really moving these markets. I hope all of you had a great holiday weekend. Consumers did a great job spending lots of money during Black Friday as sales hit an all-time record, most sales ever, ever, ever in history. Although looking at the numbers, sales were up around 2% year over year. And on an inflation adjustment basis, sales were probably down 5% year over year. Now, I'm not throwing cold water on this sales number. I'm not. But prices as you know, are much higher now than they were a year ago. Consumers are expected to buy a lot of stuff because many are struggling and you're going to get some nice discounts. We're seeing companies with loads of inventory that they have to get rid of. There's a lot of great sales out there. It's kind of expected. But is this an indication that the consumer is doing well? You better hope not. You better hope not. And I don't mean that in a, in a bad way. That I want consumers to be doing bad. But when there's impression, like, hey, the economy's okay, it's great. Do you really want that? Because you got to understand what you really want if you want to be long stocks here. Because this signals the Fed is going to continue raising rates well into next year. Especially if we get a strong job number showing fewer than expected layoffs on Friday. And then a strong CPI number, which comes out in about two weeks and a strong CPI number showing that inflation is not falling fast enough now the CPI that report comes out December 13th keep these dates in mind they're very important especially if you're a trader jobs numbers are Friday but the Fed's going to meet the very next day to hike rates but just looking at the consumer and the spending and saying, wow, it's record sales, it's record sales. They're going to be record sales, right? I mean, inflation, we have prices much, much higher. At the end of the day, you're going to see sales go up almost every single year when accounted for, yeah, I mean, as inflation goes up, you must have seen that, that number go higher and higher and higher almost every single year, right, for, for Black Friday sales and, and, and holiday sales. But we have to be careful to say, oh, wow, the consumer looks great and everything's okay because that's giving the signal to the Fed to keep raising. And right now, when they meet, and that's going to be on the 14th day after the CPI comes out, and that 50 basis point hike, which is why they expect it, could easily become another 75 basis point hike depending on the data we see over the next couple of weeks. So the monthly retail sales number is going to come out after that. After that. So this is the sales number that the Fed's going to look at and be like, whoa. Okay, things are okay. We can keep going here. So it's important to look at the jobs number and it's important to look at CPI. Now, think about what I just said. <laughs> think about it, right? Because if you're an investor who wants stocks to go higher, this is what you're hoping for. You're hoping for unemployment rate, that unemployment rate to skyrocket. This way the Fed stops raising rates. You're hoping that demand falls off a cliff so the Fed stops raising rates. You're hoping consumers stop freaking spending so much money, right? This is what the bullish thesis is. This is what we need to see for the Fed to be like, okay, we see inflation coming down. We all know inflation is coming down in some areas. I've covered it for nine months, even seven months and five months showing different areas where it's coming down. I've seen oil prices coming down. Cop prices did go up a little bit. We're seeing prices come down here and there. But what the Fed looks at is not really coming down. It's not coming down as fast as they want it. And it's not going to for a while. Because rental income is going to stay relatively high. Food prices, relatively high. Oil has come down, which is good. But if you strip out food and energy, which they like to do and call it the core, and we finally peaked a month ago, and we better hope that it's still going lower and lower. It, it has to go. It has to, right, over time. go. It's just the pace and how fast it can go lower, but it's not coming down fast enough. And that's what the Fed's looking at. This is why the Fed's backed into a corner. Since they'll eventually achieve all these goals by raising rates and removing trillions of liquidity from the market by shrinking its balance sheet, that's exactly what they're going to do. That's what they said. Good, and I, everybody agreed that's exactly what they're doing. But the question is, once we have millions of more people who are unemployed, and this is going to be by mid-next year, this is what the Fed is predicting, based on all the moves they're doing. So once we have that, 
We have the housing market incredibly, incredibly weak since most consumers can't afford to buy homes due to 6% plus mortgage rates. Once we have demand really falling off a cliff, more than 70% of the companies in the S&P 500 are going to see earnings fall by 15% plus next year, which they're projected to rise 7% next year, which is crazy, even though the Fed's pushing all these men, the Fed's doing everything he can, crush the economy. Where do you expect stocks to go? Because this is the bullish thesis. I'm going over the bullish thesis for you. And you know, I am, you listened to me for a while, for a very long time, I've been doing this 15 years. I'm optimistic about everything. I'm optimistic about everything. If there's like 50 people that I have to fight, I'm, I, I'm giving myself a chance. I'm always optimistic. That's the way I am. And right now, I'm trying to find the optimistic case for stocks because this is the bullish case. The Fed's going to slow down and we're going to see, you know, unemployment because demand's going to shrink and demand's going to contract tremendously. We, we haven't seen that yet. But this is the bullish case. For the Fed to stop raising rates, you need, they need to, to crush the economy. They need to crush the economy. And the Fed's not going to be there to back you up like it was the last 12 years, like during COVID and injected trillions into the system. They're not going to be there during the credit crisis, injecting money into the banks. They can't do that. That creates more inflation. They can't have rates at zero, which we saw basically for the last 12 years. They're going to be well above those levels, well above 4% for the entire year next year into 2024. But that's a bullish case. Now, you have to ask yourself, is all this priced in with the S&P 500 down 15% from its highs in 2022? Well, 15% sounds like a pretty big number for the S&P 500. Wow, you're down a lot, Frank. This could be factored in. But the S&P 500, listen to this, surged 27% last year, popped 16% in 2020. I bet you if you ask most people, what the S&P 500 do in 2020? They'd probably tell you, I think it was down. It went up 16%. It crashed 35%, but when you inject... 50% of the country's GDP, over $11 trillion into the market, directly to consumers and businesses, what do you think is going to happen? They're going to spend like crazy. So you push forward all this demand. And in 2020, the S&P 500 it, it, it jumped 16%. And in 2019, what happened? It rose close to 30%, even though we saw earnings year over year from 2018, 2019, fall. It fell by a, a dollar from 160 to 159 total S&P earnings. But still, the S&P 500 surged in 2019. Why? Because Trump went on a rampage and said, we need rates to go lower. And the Fed started easing because we had inflation in check at 2%. He said, okay, let's start easing, get those rates under, under 2% again. And we said 2019, but that's the last three years of the market. 27%, 16%, and 30% returns the S&P 500 last three years before this 15%. So when you put that in perspective... And you're looking at it, you're saying, wow, is that 50% decline enough? Considering we injected all this money into the system that now the Fed is doing everything in its power to remove, should we fall back to 2019 levels? That's why earnings were $160. They're projected to be $235. Holy shit, how could that happen? Not to mention, during those three years, we had interest rates were near zero. In 2019, we started lowering them, but before that, yeah, we were raising a little bit, but interest rates were considerably low. They're much, much, much higher now. We really, you know, at those levels, you couldn't put your money anyplace else. Like, right, I have to have it in equities or at least dividend paying stocks, and they're paying a yield in 1.8% or whatever by blue chip. Now you could earn, what, 4% risk free in the two year treasuries? Risk free? So I'll tell you, someone's been doing it for a long time. It's impossible to figure out how this is going to play out next year. But what I do know for a fact, I could say for a fact, I'm you know 98% sure, it's going to be one of the most volatile periods in markets that you're ever going to see. We're going to see earnings crash for most companies as demand falls due to the Fed. And that's why I've been saying buy long data puts, go nine months out. It's not just protecting your portfolio. You can make a fortune on these things because you're basically saying that these companies aren't going to meet the earnings that they're going to meet. And you see 20%. How many companies do we see 20% declines? We saw a lot of these things run up. We saw a 6% rise in the NASDAQ in one freaking day. Incredible, incredible number. So if you're short, you're just, you know, you're blowing out of everything. And, and you know, we just tell you sleeping on a park bench. But you know, long day to put, you're only losing the money you put in to do a money flow trader. So, you know, if you're looking nine months out, 12 months out, you're betting that they're not going to meet earnings estimates where you see a 20%, 30% fall, especially early on next quarter, which usually sees a weak quarter for these companies. 
They're discounting everything. It's going to be hard to keep margins up. Yes, sales are great, but your margins are probably going to be a lot lower, which means earnings are going to be lower than expected. So if they miss, especially with higher expectations as the market's kind of like a little bit in rally mode off of its lows since October still, what do you think is going to happen? So Goldman just came out. Said, look, we haven't really seen the worst of this yet. It's going to get ugly. But be careful what you wish for. We're wishing for demand to get destroyed, for unemployment to skyrocket. That's the bullish case. That's the market we're in. A market that the Fed put us in. I'm not ragging on the Fed because everybody can rag on the Fed, but that's the market that they put us in. When you keep rates super low for such a long period of time and you didn't see inflation, now all of a sudden it comes, it rushes in, the $11 trillion that you spent, rush, now you, you, you know, you're fighting to, to get this out of the market, saying, no, oh, we're going to try to avoid a recession. What? How do you avoid a recession when you're taking trillions of liquidity out of the market and you're aggressively raising rates by the fastest pace you did in the Fed era? 475 basis point hikes, and it, it's not a given that the next rate hike on the 14th, is it going to be 75 basis points depending on the data? But there's nothing there evident that, forget about the word pivot, that it shouldn't exist when we're talking about the Fed. Because a pivot means that they're going to lower. They're not lowering rates anytime soon. Probably 2025, maybe. Unless we see some kind of crazy event when the market crashes and all demand falls off a cliff, it gets crazy. But they're not going to reverse course because they, they made it clear. We need to see inflation under 2%. That's not going to happen. It's not going to happen for a very, very long time. Maybe they stop, maybe they pause, but we'll see. Now, the question is, what stock should you buy puts on? Well, I'm going to give you an example. I'm not going to say to buy puts on this name, but I'm going to give you an example. I want you to look at DraftKings. So JP Morgan, yes, they downgraded DraftKings from neutral to underweight. It was yesterday. So JP Morgan had this neutral rating on DraftKings since... December 2020, where the company IPO'd, went about $50. Now it's at 15 And again, the neutral rating they held all the way down. And now they're telling you with the stock down 70%, JP Morgan's saying, telling their clients to, to sell it. Underweight. Now, I'm not picking on JP Morgan here since, yeah, you know, we all get it wrong from time to time. The bigger takeaway from this is just because the stock is down 50% plus, like we're seeing in most tech names. We've seen in meme stocks, some biotechs. I mean, the aggressive growth names. Just because they're down 50% plus doesn't mean you should bottom fish. And I hear that on TV. Well, this is a blue cap name and you know, blue chip. And we, we, we're going to buy it and you know, long term will be fine, whatever. Okay, you said that about Disney at 140, 120, 110, it's 95. And they still don't have a business, working business model. They still have a working business model. I mean, streaming doesn't work for them. They need to sell that whole Hulu stake. Forget about buying the, the remainder of it, which I don't know where you're going to get the money from. Just sell it. Put $20 billion on your balance sheet. Anyway, I covered Disney. Dial down streaming. It's a, it's a terrible, terrible, terrible business that you can't compete with anyone else since you can't put your best content immediately on that platform. It's got to go in the movies first. It means you can't compete with Netflix. You can't compete with HBO. You can't, you know, House of Dragons is out. New Shack series is out. For HBO. You can't get that anyplace else other than HBO. You can't get some of these things. Ozarks, uh, Netflix. Yet I can see all this stuff in the movies for Disney. It's not a working business model. But be careful. Because when you're looking at names, especially DraftKings, it, it's a roll-up. Meaning it, there's a company that takes out a lot of debt and uses its stock to acquire smaller competitors to build a bigger, bigger entity. And it's a good strategy in low interest rate bull markets in this type of environment. However, if you look at DraftKings, their share count increased by 22% since its IPO. Okay, I said in December, you had to wait a month or two. I don't know if it's 36 days before all the investment bankers who helped this company raise money in its IPO could cover it. But the official date, I think it was October 2021 IPO. So December, November, December is when all these firms come out and a lot of them have buy ratings or whatever, but they can't cover it until like, you know, until this training for, I think it's either 30, 60 days. But we're talking about not that long ago. It was a company that came out with 350 million shares and now they have 426 million shares. That is a massive increase in their share count. Massive. And you say, dilution, why is that a big deal? Let me I like to explain things, right? Because people just shout out terms, dilution, dilution. What the hell is dilution? If you're a social network, you understood dilution with you know, Zuckerberg's partner, how he got wrecked. 
So if your stock is trading at $10, right? And, and 10 years from now, it's still $10. You could say, wow, I, I didn't generate anything. And the stock is flat on the year. Well, it's flat. However, the company could have a $100 million market cap today. But if they double their share count by buying companies or whatever, that they get warrants, that get exercised, whatever, that share count increased, that stock, again, yeah, it's still a 10, but it has a market cap of $200 million instead of $100 million. So your shares just got significantly diluted. And now that company has to generate twice the earnings to support its valuation. And this is common with mining stocks that don't generate money. What are they going to do? They're going to build it up. They're going to use their stock and, and constantly. You'll see, st I've seen stocks that come out with a $50 million market cap and they're at a dollar and they're at a dollar 25 and they literally have a billion dollar market cap a few years later. I'm not kidding you. <laughs> you know, I mean, they sell a company for 2 billion. That's pretty good for the owners and stuff like that. They made a lot of money. But as a shareholder, you sell a company for, for you know, a billion dollars and you made, you know, 25 cents. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's a big difference when you're a share. That's dilution. I know, you know people don't explain that to you, but it's a terrible thing, dilution. It's not the worst thing if you're using your stock to buy assets that you believe are going to be worth a lot, lot more. And Oracle has done this. You've seen, I think it was AutoZone or other companies, uh, Wayne Hazenga. There's, you know, the model works sometimes. It's very difficult, but you also see it fall on its face. But it only works in, in environments where, you, where there's super growth environments, which we don't have. Because now you have DraftKings, who's sitting on $1.3 in cash, but also has $1.3 in long-term debt. So that's a wash. None of their debt is variable. Remember I said that. I'm going to come back to it. Okay, variable means that your, interest, your payments are going to rise as interest rates rise. So that's a good thing. Thank God for them. But we're going to talk about variable a little bit. However, DraftKings spends money like just throwing it out there. I mean, you don't see companies spend as much money as this company. Just look at almost any commercial on ESPN. You look anywhere. I mean, the commercials that they have and the people that have doing the commercials. You look on TNT. They have. I mean, these guys are actually telling you what. Remember when betting was like, you know, frowned upon in sports? We don't want to see that ever. Now, that, you, know, you make money, they all embrace it. There's advertising everywhere in this industry, right? They don't care. Nobody cares. They only care about money. They care about their bottom line. When it comes to politics and companies, that's it. They're going to support the agenda that makes them the most money. That's what they do. But it's funny how that narrative has changed so much where, no, you know, be careful. Gambling's bad. Now it's like, no, no, no. They have free, you know, and Charles Barkley, Kenny Smith, the TNT, like saying, hey, I like this, you know, these guys. I think this is great to buy this guy, do this guy, and, you know, fantasy, whatever. It's crazy. But if you look at DraftKings, the money they're spending, they're going to generate probably $1.8 billion in sales in 2022, but they're, they're going to spend over $2 billion this year. And they're losing a shitload of money. Projected to lose $1.4 billion in EBITDA. Again, earnings before interest, tax, appreciate. That, 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 that's the number you, you use. is much better than earnings, but it's more pure. But that's a lot of money. <laughs> Plus, the company has contractual obligations of more than $800 million over the next two years. I don't know what those contractual obligations exactly are, but we know that they have to make $800 million in payments with $1.3 billion over the next two years. I mean, they're massive. So you're like, you know, are they generating tons of free cash flow? No. Free cash flow is projected to be negative 840 this year and close to negative 600 million next year. I know I'm throwing numbers at you, but it's important. I'm trying to help you guys out because it's a fundamental market. You have to look at balance sheets now. You have to look at debt and you have to look at growth because growth's going to slow significantly. And a lot of companies are still trading on the growth that they're expected to see over the next two to three years. So please pay attention. I'm not going to throw too many numbers at you in confusion. You're going to fall asleep while you're driving your car working out. I'm trying to make this as simple as possible for you to make a shitload of money. But now if you look at DraftKings, it comes at a time where we could see gambling slow the next few years. As interest rates go higher, the Fed's removing liquidity from the market, everyone's bills are higher, so much less discretionary spending. You have gambles of speculators where a lot of these people probably to meme stocks and crazy shitty cryptos and got killed. I know what you're thinking. I'm going to stop you before you go crazy because people say, gambling is a great sector during recessionary times. Just like other vice things like cigarettes and alcohol, they hold up. That's great. But reality. I can't see people having more money to spend gambling in 2023 than they did over the past two to three years. Can you? I Meaning, if they are gambling, right, the amount that they're gambling, and you could call that cart value, 
you call them retail or whatever. Like you know, Domino's, the reason why a company exploded is because their cart value was nine dollars, and they, it, it was, I think it was five dollars. Their cart value, the average money that someone spends, and their cart value went to like twenty two dollars because they offered a, a ton of things when you go there and you get, you know, whatever. If you want salads, if you want bowls, if you want, you know, much more than pizza or you know, the, the desserts are awesome. The lava cakes, I'm not speaking from experience. The lava cakes are awesome. And uh, those chocolate chip brownie. <laughs> but, you know, you wind up going there and say, all right, I'll take this. I'll take that. I'll take that. It's card value. The bigger the card value, the better it is, right? So you know, you're looking at, at how much they're spending. It's probably going to be much lower on a per bet basis. I mean, you have to figure that out. DraftKings also has a, a lot of competition in the marketplace. Caesars, Las Vegas Sands, MGM, Win. These guys have strong balance sheets. These are big guys. They're off in their own online gambling sites now, have a, a, a much stronger balance sheet since they're generating tons of free cash flow through their casinos, real casinos. They also have pen in that industry. And to support the insane spending, especially on ads, lobbying, which is incredibly important in this industry, lobbying, they're going to have to take on more debt. And you know how expensive debt is now compared to what it was the past couple of years? So what's my point here when it comes to DraftKings? It's much bigger than DraftKings. Just bring it up, and it's come down a lot. The balance sheet is okay. It could come down further. It's likely going to come down further. You're just spending way too much money, not expected to generate money in a long time. But if you're buying puts or betting against a stock over the next nine months, you have to start looking at balance sheets. You have to start looking at growth potential. If you have a weak balance sheet, and your model is set up to where... You're supposed to see incredible, incredible growth in the next three to five years. Chances are that stock is a great short. Or great, or you know, betting that it's gonna go lower. You have to short it. I wouldn't recommend that for individual investors ever, especially with a market crazy as it is today. We we could see, you know, 15% declines and a six percent rise in one day. And the NASDAQ, it's crazy to play those kind. But but you avoid a lot of that part if you're buying long dated puts. So you have to be very, very careful bottom fishing here. You look at DraftKings down 70% and going, wow, man, DraftKings, I like it. You have to look at the numbers. In the case of DraftKings, even with the stock down 70% from its highs, it's still crazy expensive. When are they going to make money? They're not projected, the analysts, until 2026. Get negative free cash flow. But it's a name that doesn't fit in the environment we're going to see in 2023 and 2024, which is much higher interest rates. Or, you know, much higher than they were in the past. That they were going to raise a lot further from here. Hopefully we don't. We're at 4%. Maybe we go to 4.5 to 5% we're supposed to peak at. But 5% is a lot higher than zero was for most of the past 12 years. This name doesn't fit in the environment. Not just because of that, but with the Fed shrinking its balance sheet and taking liquidity out of the market. So the roll-up model where you take on huge debt, dilute the crap out of your stock, spend a shitload of money, is a model fully dependent on growth. Growth that, where's it coming from? Tell me. Please tell me. I do this for a long time. I have no idea where the growth's coming from next year. It's not coming from the Fed. It's definitely not coming from China. Holy shit. But where will it come from? So well, gambling, most, st- most states that will pro-online gambling already approve gambling. And those that haven't are likely not going to. And DraftKings is available in most states. There's only 10 where it's not available. And that's probably for its fantasy. There's a few more that it's not available when it comes to the actual online gambling, when it comes to, you know, betting games, not just, you know, fantasy. Because that fantasy part is legal in Florida, but we can't use DraftKings to, as far as a state where they don't provide online gambling. It's crazy. You can bet on horses. You can bet on anything. You can drive while you're looking at your phone here. Don't have to put your blinkers on. But don't. Do anything. Don't online gambling. No way. Can't do it. <laughs> anyway, smoke pot in a lot of places, but just don't. Not online gambling. We're not going to allow it. Which is crazy. But where's the growth coming from? Because when more states are going to improve, not really. Consumers are coming back spending. DraftKings doesn't have pricing power, right? And it's, it's, there's a ton of competitors, online gambling sites. It's almost a commoditized business where if DraftKings takes more of the rake. I'd go someplace else to bet the football game and play fantasy football someplace else. Why do I need DraftKings? So seriously, not sure where the growth's going to come from. So where am I going with all of this? All of this nonsense I just threw at you. Where am I going with it? There's a point. I'm just giving you, I like to bring up an example. 
I tell you to go buy puts on DraftKings. It's down a lot. I think it's going to come lower. I think there's much better, better plays that you can make a fortune on that are going to earnings going to come down significantly. I mean, now when you're seeing underweight ratings with JP Morgan, you know you're seeing like you're looking at stocks down 50, 60 percent, even like Disney, where nobody downgraded the stock. Who's downgrading Disney? Nobody. This expectation is still sky high. People are still telling you it's Disney. It's going to come back. Iger, he's great. Is it? What is he going to do to make it come back? I mean, this guy can't. Wave that magic Disney wand and everything's going to be good. Now you have serious problems, serious debt problems. It's a broken company. Do I think it could fix it? Yes. Go back to storytelling. Go back to, to you know, make sure you have a tight cost structure. That takes a long time. You got to rethink your streaming business because you're losing billions, billions, and billions. And now the one metric that everyone relied on is going to continue to go lower because people are not going to pay for that service. They're not going to pay higher prices and ads for a service they really don't like in the first place. Sorry. We got all these people. They don't want to pay for the site. So what are we going to do? Let's throw ads on it and let's raise the price. <laughs> what? That's the solution? Okay, good luck. You have to offer more. You have to come up with new content, which unfortunately costs tens of billions. They expect for $30 billion. But this is where you look at a companies where DraftKings, there's a lot of negativity on it. It was a SPAC. It, all this, you know, a lot could be factored in. Maybe it comes down a little bit more. There's a lot of stocks down 56% that come down much, much, much further. Where expectations are very, very high and earnings estimates are very, very, very high still. So fundamentally, this is where I'm going with this. Start doing your research. I know it's the holiday season, but you want to make a fortune. This is what great investors do. Sometimes when people are going out and hanging out and being like, oh, that's fine. I'm not telling you not to do that. Spend time with your family, hang out. Your kid's going to be off school, going on a little vacation or whatever. But the people who are making money, do your research now. Screen for companies that have lots of debt, the most debt in the industry, net debt. Net debt. And look, compared to cash flow, everybody destroyed AT&T, all oh, $30 billion in debt before you know they spun off Time Warner. I mean, their free cash flow they were generating were like you know, $10, 15000000000 billion in free cash flow. You got to factor that in. So yes, a lot of debt, but when you look at companies that have a lot of debt, but they're not generating free cash flow, how do they pay for that debt? They got to take out more debt and more debt, which is much more expensive. Is that debt variable? Try to figure that out. You might have to do a little digging. I could figure it out pretty easy through my systems, but that's what I'm doing. I'm doing search to see which companies have variable debt, which is most small businesses. Look at small caps. That aren't generating a lot of the SP, a lot of the, the Russell 2000 companies, a lot of those aren't expected to generate earnings over the next couple of years. But those are the companies you need to avoid. Avoid all the companies that are not expected to generate money over the next couple of years. And there's a lot of those. And those companies have a lot of debt. Again, look if it's variable. If it's variable, that means as those payments are starting to go much, much higher in a market where you've seen demand fall off a cliff. And if you don't have pricing power, what do you do? Now you're talking bankruptcy. But there are a lot of companies like this, a lot. And that's why it's dangerous. I can't predict where the market's going to go. I do know that earnings are going to come down significantly. I know a lot of crazy tech companies fit this profile because they decided to sacrifice profits for subscriber growth. That's what everybody wanted to see. I need to see subscriber growth. Work for Disney. Just I don't care if you're making money on it. I just need to see it. Holy shit, you have more subscribers than any 200 million, 150. That's going to 200 million subscribers. If you're giving this shit away for free, numbers eventually matter. Especially when you're sitting on the highest net position, net debt position in, in your company's history for Disney. It matters. These numbers matter in a high interest rate environment. And you have to be willing to adapt. You have to adapt to the market conditions. You can't be stubborn in your ways. And I see it with gold. People recommend gold since the 70s. The same exact thesis for today. I see with technology companies. I see with growth companies. Oh, they just buy them as they go low. Just buy them as they go low. That worked for 12 years when interest rates are 0%. And the Fed constantly flooding the money with cash and buying bonds. That's not there now. And it's not going to be there for several years. It's a market that anyone who's been doing this for just 10 years has never seen before. You have to be willing to adapt. You have to look at the numbers. And any company that's forecasted to see 20% plus in earnings growth over the next two years... Probably the easiest shorts. That's not going to happen. A lot of growth is coming from overseas. They're in a lot more trouble than we are. Avoid most roll-ups. The companies have taken on a lot of debt to acquire small competitors. Avoid companies that, that base their entire growth model on China. That's Nike, Starbucks, Yum Brands, even Microsoft, IBM. 
Microsoft, not so much, seeing growth in other areas, but still a lot from China. Win, Intel, Intel, 27% of sales come from China. Broadcom, which is Avago, is 35%. Look what China's doing. China's horrible right now. They're not going to change that COVID policy anytime soon. When you're looking right now into next year, this is what you need to do. You go to Finviz. You could screen for a lot of this stuff. That's a free site. Again, I don't get paid by them or whatever. You want to use them or whatever free site. There's sites that offer screens that you could put. Companies expected to generate strong earnings growth. Be careful. It switches on a dime. We start the biggest companies in the world with Walmart, with Target, with all the semiconductors, with all the autos who is saying the second half of this year is going to be crazy good. It's going to be awesome. When you raise rates by the percentage you raise them, and a lot of these companies are sitting on massive debt, depending on that growth, it shuts off very, very quickly when you're raising rates at the fastest pace we've ever seen. So it's going to be very hard to get that growth. But screening for these companies, it's two things, guys. It's not only going to help you find companies that you can buy long-dated puts on, which we do in Money Flow Trader, since they're likely going to report terrible and horrible numbers in the coming quarters as growth slows to a crawl, which the Fed is doing everything in its power to do. But also important, the screen's going to help you identify the companies that are in a great position to take market share and the ones that you want to own, which is a lot of ones in our portfolios right now. And that's why you want to do this screen because it's going to help you eliminate a lot of those stocks that maybe even some of them down 50% in your portfolio that you're looking to hold and you're looking at going, wow, these guys have a lot of debt. They're not really generating that much cash flow. You know, I know they're down a lot. I think it's going to come back. I mean, that's a mentality, especially for, from amateur investors. You do that a lot. And I'm only saying that because I've done that and I've made that mistake. Oh, it'll come back. Don't worry, I'm just going to keep holding it forever. In the meantime, that opportunity cost of you pulling it out and putting it into a company that's gaining market share that could do great over the next two years and dominant because they have a good balance sheet. They are going to see a little bit of growth, a good management team. They're buying back their stock. Insiders are buying, which you're not really seeing at all in this market. Think about it. The market is down as far down as the market is right now. Why aren't we seeing insider buying? Why not? We've seen tons of insider sell, especially in the oil industry, even at these levels, which is interesting. Because everyone, I can't find a person that's not bullish on oil. I'm also, you know, not crazy bullish on oil, but yes, I think oil is going high. We did an issue on it. But just different industries that you're looking at and different stocks that you're looking at. But that's by screening for this and look you as the most debt and following that formula. This is what you should be doing right now because next year is going to be crazy volatile and crazy, crazy ugly. Not for all stocks, but for many of them. Because we're in a market where you can generate 30% plus returns in a year buying the right name, but you could also lose 30% in a day by having the wrong name in your portfolio, which I know a lot of you listeners have probably seen. But one of your stocks in your portfolio down 30% in a day. And when you're just sitting there and you look to your left in a two-year, it's just sitting there at 4% risk-free, that's a really good option for a lot of people to say, F it, I'm just going to avoid the market since it's too crazy for me. And how crazy is it? Look at the last couple days. Holy shit. The market fell yesterday because of a massive slowdown in China. We've seen this incredible uprising of people fight against the government's crazy COVID policy. But today, one day later, one day later, everything's fine. China stocks are surging. Since COVID rates fell for the first time in the week, where do we get this data from? China's government who lies about everything. Doesn't matter if we can't trust a number. One day, we went from, holy shit, China. Look at the videos going on. Oh my God, today everything's fine. One day, China's perfect now. We're good. And come back online. Everything's great. Haven't we heard that story for like nine months now about COVID? The last nine months of people telling me that China, China's a growth story. China's a growth story. That's the growth. That's the growth. They're going to come back online. That's where the growth's coming from. Really? Because we're nine months in. It doesn't look any. It looks a lot worse now than it did nine months ago. But this is how crazy the market is right now. And seriously, one day China's in channels to the next. Everything's okay. I mean, I don't know if you've seen videos on what's going on in China, but, you know, look at YouTube, not the regular media which has an agenda. Okay, China, it's the reason why we don't, we're not allowed to say anything bad about China ever. We, everything's Russia's fault. We kill Russia. We have no ties. We have massive ties in the US. So our policies have massive ties to the US. So, you know, NBA, massive ties to China, right? So we're always very, very like hesitant to say anything bad about China at all the time, right? So even the videos that we're showing, we've seen a couple of them here and there. Look at YouTube. There's a couple of guys that are, that, that are reporting on the ground there 
I, I just, I can't believe, I'm very surprised YouTube hasn't shut them off yet. Yeah, I don't get paid by any of these guys, but holy shit. I mean, these guys are uh, just showing things, showing videos, going over it. It's not crazy. Uh, I've got one site that they have like two, I think it's 200,000 subscribers now, but just reporting of what's going on. But you have to realize when it comes to China, guys, I mean, if you speak out against the government, that's a death sentence. So when you're looking at, at these people and protesting, and this is how terrible the conditions are in China right now. And these people are risking their lives protesting against the government because they can't take it anymore. That shit doesn't go away in a day. That's never happened in China. That never happened in China. Where you see this massive uprising of people who basically, seriously, risk their lives to speak out against the government. You're not allowed to ever. They're checking phones there. They're making sure you have no outside sources. I mean, it's, it's crazy. You're locking doors and fires. It, it, it's nuts there. You get very good sources that send me shit. They've been sending me shit for, for months. For months and months and months, saying, friend, this is really bad. People aren't talking about it. Now you're hearing a little bit about it. They suppress a lot of information. But it's really, really crazy over there. And again, you're shutting off another area of growth, which is China. That's the biggest growth engine. And also the Fed. So where's the growth going to come from? So you choose to invest, guys. Go by the playbook I just mentioned. Because not time to say, all right, I'm taking a chance on this. You know what? I'm going to buy this stuff. It's not the time to take chances. It's not the time to be aggressive. There's times to be aggressive. There are times to be super aggressive. It's not now. Don't go out there and say, well, Frank, I can buy this stock down 60%. doesn't matter. Fred's job, their number one priority is to crash the economy. They can't say that, but that's what they're looking to do. They won't stop until inflation falls at 2 to 3%, which won't happen in 2023. And likely, we won't see inflation at those levels well into 2024. You'll be like, Frank, you're crazy. This is what every economist is actually predicting. And sell-side firms are predicting that the CPI will fall to a low around, I think, 27 to 3% was the lowest I saw by year-end 2024. Couple that with the Fed is saying now, we need to see inflation back to 2%. Meaning that they're not going to lower rates for at least another 24 months. Granted, a lot could happen in that time. We could see the market absolutely collapse, demand collapse, and then like, okay, we got to reverse course, but it's going to result in a market. You're going to see a market crash first and all that to happen. You're not going to see this, oh, retail spending is good. Oh, jobs numbers are still good. That's giving the Fed the okay that to keep going and going and going until they say 2% and going higher and higher. But 24 months from now, that's a long time. It's a very long time. So guys, adjust accordingly. You're going to see that in our portfolios. We have some long positions. Did great during earnings season. Again, we, we, this is what we do. Fundamentals finally matter. It's nice that they finally matter. Where you can't just look at a company trading at 300 times sold earnings and 35 times sales and saying, well, they're going to grow their base from 5 million to 75 million subscribers over the next six, seven. No. No. Easy. Easy to buy puts on those stocks even if they're down 50, 60% right now because that growth is gone. They have to tighten up. They're going to have to fire employees, cut costs dramatically. And a lot of these companies have not been around long enough where they've been through that type of market. When you look at, at you know, the Exxons, the IBMs, the home builders, Going through the credit crisis. I mean, these guys know exactly what to cut. You're looking even at mining industry. They know if this comes to here, this is what we're cutting. We're cutting this, 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 and this. A lot of these companies don't know how to do that. And it's not easy to do because, you know, you have these company parties and everybody's happy. You have to make these cuts. And they're usually very slow to do it. And that's something else that's not factored in. Like, how do we really cut back? Like, look at Peloton. They should have cut back much, much quicker than they did. Before they were like, holy shit, the man just completely shut off. Zoom, the man completely shut off. Not completely, but you have to get ahead of this. And right now, it's very easy to get ahead. There's a lot of CEOs of the conference calls, guys, that, that they'll tell you, listen, we had good numbers, but no, we're preparing. Those are the companies that are in good shape. The companies that have good numbers and say, hey, things are great. I'm not seeing shit right now. Everything's great. Demand's great. Those are the companies. Buy puts on. It's a layup. It's a layup. Buy long data puts. They're not going to make the next two quarters. You can't tell me they're going to outpace companies like... Walmart and Target, who, who did a great job with their supply chains and improving their supply chains, or companies that have been through that, that, that got wrecked, they're not, they're not in that position to do it. So any company that reported that's, that reported good numbers, that had pricing power, that are still projecting that very strong growth, and hey, we're not seeing demand so at all, it's a layup. 
they're going to see demand. Everyone is going to see this. Every business across everywhere is going to see this. It's very difficult. Well, almost every business. Banks should hang in there. Higher interest rates are better for them. But they are losing investment banking fees with IPOs, M&A, you know, crawling, you know, just slow to a halt. But this is how you have to look at the market going forward. It's a good opportunity to make a lot of money. But it's also a way to help you avoid a lot of the bullshit. And that's why this strategy is very, very good. If you're interested in Money Flow Trader, again, we're still offering that $4.99 price tag for three months, which is a $5,000 product, but we discounted it. It's on our website. If you're interested, if not, no worries. Learn how to buy long dated puts. It's a strategy that's going to work over the next year. It might not work two years from now, three years from now. It didn't work three years from now when the market goes up every fucking year. But you know what? Over the next couple of years, where earnings are going to come down dramatically, much more than anyone's predicting. This is a strategy that is not about hedging your portfolio. You can make an absolute fortune. And you should see some of the emails that we're getting of people taking screenshots of just some of the puts that they're buying in some companies that are getting absolutely nailed on earnings. It's a very good strategy. That's something you should focus on. But those are screens. So just accordingly, guys. So that's it for me. Questions, comments, I'm here for you. FrankCurzioResearch.com. That's Frank at CurzioResearch.com. I always say this all the time, and I truly mean it. Thanks for all the support, all the listeners out there. I really, really appreciate it. Even people have different opinions than me. I love getting your emails and stuff. It's rolling this together to try to make money, and at times to try to save money and not get crushed, right? It's offense, defense. Times play offense, other times play defense. Now you have to be careful. But I love hearing from you guys. Let me know what's going on across your industry. If you're seeing strong demand, I want to hear it. There's no bias to what I'm saying. This is what I hear from the tons of listeners in over 100 countries that actually listen to this podcast. If I hear something, I'll question them. I'll look at it. it it's, you know, again, it's not like you, you have this agenda no matter what. I'm supporting gold and gold's going to be the reserve currency. I'm taking it no matter what changes or what happens. If we have zero interest rates, you're still on the gold thesis for 40 years. No, that's not what we do here. Want to get ahead of the markets and you do that by having a great network, which is you. And I really, really appreciate it, guys. So I'll see you guys in about 24 hours. Again, email is frankersresearch.com. I'll see you then. Take care.